Oh, God, there's an in-joke there. Right, everybody, annotation. We are going to be looking at the archaeology and history of Cymru, and this is part one. Um, I've sort of thought that this is going to be a very difficult one because there's probably 5,000 religious places in Cymru that I could have visited, and we are going to visit six. So. Um, I thought that one of you who asked a question about a certain church in the week, um, their wish will be fulfilled today. I do believe that one location that we're going to be visiting uh, today, some of you have been there with me. Another location I've broken into with Michelle. Um, for the record, um, we had a key. Um, and. I've decided I'm going to visit two sites in North Wales, one in West Wales, two in South Wales, and one of, in sort of, um, sent, um, well, sort of South Wales. Anyway, so Peter and Pat, we're going to go on this journey. Pat asked me straight away, where is this? <laughs> and this is a church in the Vale of Morgan, fondly known as Slanfranach's Church, Otlan Branach's Church. It's two churches that we're looking at today associated with the same saint. And this location of this church, it can be said, uh, was once very isolated, but now this church is next door to a new housing estate. That monstrosity outside Cowbridge on the way to Pentram Myrick. Oh. Yes, that one, yes. This Bye church is, this church, this church is a wonderful church. Um, you do need a key to go into it. It's one of two churches in Available Morgan that does not have electricity. That there, um, we're starting off with a with a bit of this. One thing I always get asked uh, is where is the um, war, medieval wall paintings to be found in churches in the Vale of Glamorgan. And interestingly enough, we've got wall paintings in churches in the Vale of Glamorgan um, at Colminston. We've got wall paintings in the Vale of Glamorgan at St. Peter's Church at Cogan Hall. We've got wall paintings at Lancarven. We've got wall paintings at this one in the Vale of Glamorgan, Clan Mice in the Vale of Glamorgan. In fact, there's quite a few medieval wall paintings in churches in Available Morgan, and if not, across Wales. And we do have a lot of images to go through. So it's best if anyone's got to say anything, you two, I will come to you. Um, and other than that, I will um, keep flowing. Okay. It's a really quaint church indeed. And there's a big key that you can pick up from the local church. But the first place that we're going to go to, Dell is shouting out, I know he is, we're going to look at St. Roch's Chapel. St. Roch is the patron saint of death, or disease, or plague, which is rather appropriate, don't you think so, Peter? Yes, at the moment, yes. Yes. <laughs> But unfortunately, the aerial view doesn't show us much. And we'll, um, if Ellen was on, if Ellen was one of my guests, she would be saying, where is this? Where is this? I will be showing you a map of all the locations. But if I'm sounding a bit loud, sorry, this lecture does excite me. Like all the lectures on a Wednesday evening, I do love these lectures on a Wednesday evening. It lets me let my hair down to explore a little bit more topics that I've really got a passion for for our wonderful land of Cymru. That arrow there is pointing to where, where this chapel is. It's completely hidden. And this here is Merthyr Mawr House. This is Merthyr Mawr Estate. And if you ever do want to go to this church, forget it. You're unlikely going to get permission to go and visit it. I would not advise anyone to wander through the bushes to visit the church. Um, but that's the only way of actually doing it to actually trespass. But it's a very strange monument. I don't like it much because it's a little bit fake. But then again, I'm sure one or two of you 
would have liked me to have visited this site. And this is where we're going to go. So I just showed you a little image of it. Ooh, spooky, but we're going to come back to that. So the map itself, for Ellen's uh, point of view, because everyone knows where these sites are, that is you, Annie. That's Ogmore Castle, which we visited a few times. This is Murtha Mauer. And on the way through to Murtha Mauer, along these two roads, there is um, Murtha Mauer House. Now, to actually get into the, the back of Murtha Mauer House, uh, you need to drive down here, down here, and there is the church. I'm not supposed to be telling you this, but there's a chasm at the back of the church, which is a hundred foot deep chasm. And at the bottom of it, there's little tunnels going off. Um, and in those tunnels, they found some objects associated with the new inn, which is if you, if you want to visit my Saturday evenings, you'll find more about the new inn um, with my new series about myths, ghosts and legends coming up in, um, which is this starting this Saturday again. Um, and what I would like to do is go to that image and look nicely at my notes. Now, did you know, Pat, that there was a chapel at the back of Murtha Mauer House? Yes, you took me there, and I saw the chasm too, a long time ago. Hang on a minute, Pat, hang on a minute. Just between you and I, right? That must have been a long time ago, Pat. It was, yeah. By any chance, did we actually um, trespass? Well, we drove past the front door when we were driving and then we got out. I don't know if the, the lady said we could go or not. I, I think, but I remember that church and then I remember the chasm because that was amazing. Big hall. Oh, it was. Yeah. Do you know what? I'm so excited that you've seen it. I um, I'm going to ask Peter. It's a bit of a silly question. Have you ever seen this site, Peter? No, I haven't. No. Uh, and I don't mind One thing I was going to say, you're on about the paintings. Weren't all the paintings covered over by Henry VIII? Well, actually, Peter, um, some of the paintings were actually covered up before Henry VIII. Um, oh. But lots of them were covered up at the time of Henry VIII. And the ones that were still visible were covered up again just before the Puritans started wandering through the Vale of Morgan in 1650. So what I'm going to do, there it is. Pat remembers it. There's a, there's a, a few... Um, stones um but we're not really going to look at those stones today i want to do that as part of my um inscription uh, lecture which is part of the next series but there are a, a few inscribed stones medieval inscribed stones which are deposited in that church and do you know what i'm going to do i'm going to read out my my notes and then i'm going to completely disagree with them but that there is otherwise known as the goblin stone this was once in a field near candleston castle it went outside Candleston Castle, and there's lots of myths and legends associated with that. Probably moved to Murtham Hour Church, and then ended up in St. Mark's Chapel um, um, Yard itself. It's a rather interesting a stone, and it's got a wonderful inscription on it. Uh, uh, we're doing churches today, not inscriptions, but it's a wonderful stone from the height of the medieval period, the wonderful illumination of our wonderful land, and it's... It's there for people to see. It, it's a wonderful relic. Um, hang on a minute. One second. I'm just a bit... Hang on. We've, we've... Oh, hang on a minute. We're missing a few slides, which is a bit of a shame. Anyway, back, back to this image. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, boundy onto my notes, read a few notes out, um, and let's go on to that one. Right. So the Chapel of St. Rocks, this nice little entry here, um, it goes to say the history. The chapel itself is set inside an Iron Age fort, suggesting an early foundation. Ooh, mm, do I agree or disagree with that? Well, the church itself doesn't really tell me that it was of a very early foundation at all. Some historians say that the church itself only dates to the 1400s. I say that the church only dates to the beginning of the 1900s. Um, it may have been constructed by Sir John Nicholl. And um, Sir John Nicholl came into the estate of Merthyr Mawr at 1804 and was probably a resident there by 1809. And the one thing that we can say 
about Merthyr Mawr House and Estate is the cynicism associated with the new inn because they own the new inn and all the legends associated with, with murders associated with the new inn go directly back to the Nickel family. Um, and it's likely that um, the, the church itself uh, was, if it was part of an early foundation of a church, which I very much doubt, the church was probably built fresh at the beginning of the 1800s. And it was built fresh in the 1800s as part of a pilgrimage route to increase the trade to the new inn. And you know what happened to people who went to the new inn, don't you? Anyway, um, what we do know, the ruins that you actually see in front of you there today, the ones that you're looking at, um, in my notes, even say that it's a small chapel in Tudor Gothic style. And it's saying that the architecture there was restored in the 1800s. And I remember, Pat, did I not? We had a bit of a debate about this and we were really unsure whether it was medieval or not, if you can remember. Yeah. Yeah, we had that debate. And when we actually went in there, I can remember saying, actually, that stonework looks like it's been taken from another building. And this stonework is possibly not from an original medieval building at the site. And the material looks like it's been dragged in by the Nichols family. But one thing that we do know of is the two inscribed stones associated with the 10 hundreds or even earlier have been brought into that site by the Nichols family to enhance the sense of the pilgrimage route that we see associated with St. Rock's Chapel, um, the saint associated with plague and death. But we alas go on to another site and that's where we're gonna go on to now. The problem is with a, with a journey like this is that we can't spend too long on individual sites. This here is Llanfranach Church. And Llanfranach Church itself alas as part of the story associated with Lanfranach church is a church which was in complete isolation let's look at the border um a church of complete isolation i went there with my granddad in about 1988 and when you think about it look how far the a48 is away from it look how far the nearest building is away from it look at that all the way up there it was completely isolated and there you go. And now, unfortunately, the new housing estate puts the boundary of the church directly next to it. And I don't oh. believe that the church will survive very long, Pat. Oh. And the, the problem is, the reason why I say the church not going to survive very long, it's now very vulnerable. And I believe the only way that the church can really survive is it's brought back into use by the church. I am writing what I say. There's no more than two services a year at that church of Lanfranex. If they brought put electricity into the church uh, and they brought the community, which has just been um, the building houses is a new estate year, but the houses are a million pounds each. And I do believe that Goth was going to spend his millions and move here, but he decided not to because it's it, it partly a floodplain as well. Um, and up here as well, there's a hill fort. So a very bad place to build um, a housing estate. And one thing I will say uh, on my little um, on my little preaching box is that the, uh, there are uh, there were archaeological remains of a medieval village here, but none of them were found by the archaeologists. Oh. I'm not going to say any more because they needed to pay, put, build the housing estate. So what we're going to do, I'm going to look at a few images. They're inside Lanfranich Church. Oh. Um, you've got to go there. And do you know what? Um, and I know Rosamond is with us tonight. Rosamond, the, the mobile phone has arrived that we can do live broadcasts of sites that we're going to be visiting in the next few months. So everybody be aware we might be visiting this site with a live broadcast. So I will send you all the links and all the rest of it. That's inside the church. There's no electricity there, Pat. There's no electricity oh, there, Pete. Beautiful. That's, that's going towards, um, that's going towards the, um, the tower. And when I say um, 
we sort of broke into here. Um, we actually got the we actually got the key to go into. We had to leave a deposit to go in, um, and actually there, there was a, there's a little doorway into the tower, um, and we touched the lock and it literally fell apart. So we we went up to the top into the tower and there's a beautiful bell there. We went actually, I went onto the steeple and looked out. It was a beautiful view. And guess who had vertigo there and then? Me. Um, I, I was petrified and I ended up going down the ladder and all the rest of it getting out. But it's a beautiful arrangement in there. But I wouldn't advise anyone going up there because the steps are as rotten as anything. But on oh, the floor, there's all these slab stones, all these beautiful slab stones. And these slab stones themselves give a, a greater impression of the church. And there is a little bit of wall painting in there, which we've already seen. Um, now, what we're going to do, I'm going to get onto my mouse and I'm going to look and we're going to look at this church. Um, there you go. The church graveyard has got a wonderful preaching cross. Uh, the actual preaching cross itself, the shaft is gone. This is, this is modern. But the plinth itself dates to the 1400s and if you wanted a lecture on on churches and ins and outs of churches if anyone writes it this down quickly um a church a church usually found itself having the um the nave built first so to be able to give a quick lecture about um church building and styles and stuff uh, what happened with the church the church phases the um this is built first um start again in the Vale of Glamorgan, some churches had their nave built first, before the Normans got to the area. Um, Norman churches in the Vale of Glamorgan usually had um, the chancel built first. So two different styles. Cymru churches had the nave built first. Norman churches had the chancel built first. I hasten to add that this is a, this is a, 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 a church that dates from before the Norman period. So that means that the nave was built first um, and not the chancel. So we're talking about rough date of about the 10 hundreds maybe. And then what we then find is that the chancel is then added probably in about the 11 hundreds. Usually churches in the Vale of Glamorgan have their tower added by about the late 1300s, 1400s at the Owen Glindua period. And then you bang in the porch which always looks like it's been added on sometime around the, um, let me give you a date, about 15, 1600s. And what's going on here? Well, I always say that these steps are being added, associated with a preach, preaching cross, cross plinth. The steps are added, they're about in the 1400s, the revival of the church in the 1400s. But the, this plinth itself would have stood in the yard in reference to the time that there wasn't a church there. People would preach from the plinth. That's the whole point. The plinth itself. And there wasn't a stone shaft that projected up into the heavens. What there was, was a piece of wood carried around by a clergyman across the, the wonderful land of ours, before the Normans, before they had all these intricate churches and so on. Things change. Um, and that gives you a bit of a story. So. Um, a few more bits of detail and a few nice, nice things to say. Look at the size of the church graveyard. It's bloody huge. Lots of burials under this, but few gravestones. Um, and again, another nice, that's the image of the back of the church. Uh, very few people go around the back of the church. No gravestones, but it would have been full of gravestones at one point. Uh, we've gone back somewhere else. Um, and Ellen has just joined us. So there we go. Um, I'll say hello to Eleanor in a moment. And there we go again. We're looking at this. Now I'm going to tell you a few other things. The reason why I'm saying that the this, this central part of the church uh, could be actually um, pre-Norman um, is because we know via the archaeology that the fields around were a teeming Roman archaeological remains. And then early medieval remains, needing that this was a Christian community in the late Roman period. Um, and being late Roman period, Christianity, bang, they would have needed a church. So early wooden church, stone church before the Normans. And then things change and evolve. Um, so I'm actually, I'm, actually, I'm actually performing as if I'm on a stage, aren't I, tonight? Which is probably not a good idea. That's all right. 
Um, so that's the old little lane, the old little windy lane. Why the church survived isolated is an enigma. But there are many churches throughout Wales that survive by themselves and completely isolated. Let's think of Denevor Church, for example. Uh, let's think of um, Hen Egloy's church, for example. Dale, you mentioned that clue to where we might be going today. Um, and lots of other isolated churches. What's happened is the, the, the landscape become, um, the, the landscape um, was bereft of housing um, due to plagues, due to abandonments. And what happened is the church survived to serve the farming community. We see this in Powers and other places of Cumley as well. Again, that nice little image. Um, it, again, I wouldn't recommend going up the steeple, right? Um, but it's a beautiful view of the Vale of Glamorgan. It really, really is. Um, I was too afraid when I went up there to take the camera um, because I needed a grip and all the rest of it, so I didn't do that. Again, back inside the church, it's really simple. It would be a shame to lose this church. Um, a few, another interesting thing about this is it got, it's, got a, it's got something which is quite rare. If you see there, you've got a style. This leads from the north into the church graveyard. This is known as a coffin style. So basically, um, the coffin would have rested on the central pillar. And the reason why there's two um, sandstone, not sandstone, limestone uh, vertical slabs is that you would have needed two people to take it over, the, over, over uh, particularly if it's a wide coffin, but you'd have needed two people. And this is known as a coffin style. There are one, there, I think there's another one in the Vale of Morgan somewhere, another church, but this is particularly with Lambranics. At the back side of the church, along the north end, and do you know what I would say, folks, right, is get out to this church, go to the crossing when it's open, right, get the key. Even if you don't get the key, look into the church graveyard. It's lovely. It's a nice little treat. Take a packed lunch sit on the um th those steps associated with the uh, preaching cross it's a really nice visit I, I would very much advise it and it's very very quiet go there before the plebs from the um the new village actually start to change things in the atmosphere and interestingly enough there are some very early medieval carved stones and that one there is a rather early one you can see there that it's almost a, this, this, this like 12, um, 1300s in date. And you've got some a little bit later ones, but these, these are all a really nice association of stones. And these have been rearranged inside the church for you to see. Can't see these outside. It's good that they're outside. Go inside, have a good old look. It's, it's really worthwhile. And if Rosamond, you and I ever get out there, right, with, with our little... Um, filming we will film this for everybody to see it will be a good experience for those that can't actually visit there so again moving on and look at that there we we, we this was the first sort of image we looked at today um and there it is again that's the chancel it's it's quite plain it's quite crude it's quite basic and you know what i hasten to add lots of the churches in the vale of Gamorgan have frescoes around this area that's where the frescoes are associated with saint peter's this is the ones associated with colwinston and maybe there could actually some be some painted frescoes underneath all this it'd be great and that there leads us directly onto the gallery but you know what we've got to leave this church now um we've got another four to do and i wonder if i'm gonna actually do it um do you know what i need a, a couple of seconds break Peter, have you ever been to this church? No, no. Pat, have you been there with me? No. Huh. Do you know what, Pat? It was one of those Fridays that you missed. It was, yes. Huh. Um, but I love this church. It's a really nice church. But you know where we're going to go now? We're going to go to North Wales. We're going to go to good old Gogleth Cymru. And... Peter, you went with me to um, St. Dynwyn's Church, didn't you? There was only about seven yeah. people in that trip, wasn't there? Did you go with yeah. us to North Wales, Pat? Yes, yes. Yeah, oh, my did. God, you were, the, you were the other one who went. 
<laughs> I don't think there was many more, actually. There was me, Michelle, Chris, and I think three others, I think. There weren't many. But anyway, um, we went... We went to this wonderful church. We had to, if you remember, Pete, we, we parked at the car park and we had a load of sand to walk. That's and, it, yeah. And uh, this was once an island and now it's no longer an island. You can get out to it. Um, I think you can get out to it or in, yeah. in most tides, anywhere, unless there's a heavy tide. But we're now on Anglesey. This is where we're going to go. Um, and if anyone's ever heard of St. Doinwin, shout out. This is um, this is Valentine's Day in Cymru. This this is this is our Valentine's Day. The twenty the twenty oh God, I'm going to get this wrong. The twenty fifth of January, or is it the twenty sixth of January? It's Can't 25th. remember everything, folks. But this is Welsh Saint David. Uh, this is Welsh Valentine's Day. But we've got to do things differently in in Cymru, and strangely enough. In the top of my head, Peter, there's links with this church uh, and Cornwall. Um, but I'm not sure I know anything more than that. So, do you know what? On the last one, I didn't even look at my notes. So that's, you know, I, I know that the other one that we've looked at, but I'm going to look at my notes on this one. We've got a nice little story. Peter remembers this church. It's a wonderful church. Uh, it's a bit windswept, but it's part of that monastic bent that things changed associated with Henry VIII, then we need to explore that a little bit deeper. But let's sort of, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to chuck a few slides, miss all these a minute, and I'm going to want this. I, I need this one. Um, this is dating from, this, this, is a, a, this is dated from the 1700s, I do believe, usually around that date. So there's a lot more standing in the 1700s. Looking out at the landscape, Looking out at the landscape, do you know that um, the the coastline of Holly of of of, of Hollyhead and Anglesey has more shipwrecks than than anywhere in Britain? There's there's hundreds, if not thousands, of shipwrecks. And further up along the coast is the Resurgum, which is the first um, submarine um, ever to go to sea, but it sank. But th th that that fact. Um, is going to be lost on some of you, it's not even relevant, but nice thing to actually chuck in there. So, obviously you're still looking at, at an image, are you not, Peter? Yes, we're looking at it, yes. yes right, good. now the history and legend. Now, St. Doinwin is believed to have been a daughter of the King of Brycainiog. Me and Del mentioned Brycainiog just before we cut off the mics, Brycainiog is the old um, princely landscape of Brecknockshire. Um, and this story goes back to the 400s. Um, Doinwen, she lived on Anglesey, being the daughter of the King of Brycainiog. Why she was there, don't know. And her name is still recalled in the place name, Anis Flandoin. Uh, otherwise known uh, as St. Doinwin's Island. Now, interestingly enough, Peter, there's also a St. Andoin in Advent, Cornwall, and this is associated with St. Doinwin. There's the link with Cornwall, Peter. Um, I don't know where Advent is in Cornwall, but I'm sure you can show me on a map sometime. In yeah. the tale told of her, Doinwen falls in love with a young man named Malon. But typical fashion, she rejects his advances. Stories differ substantially on the events that follow, but the outcome remains the same. Either she is raped by Malon and prays for assistance from God and wishes to go into a life uh, all by herself, or she is unable to marry him due to her father's refusal, the king's refusal, and prays to forget her love for him. An angel provides her with a potion, it said. My young, her lover, drinks it and turns into ice. Well, that's not good, is it? Doinwen then prays for three requests. 
Uh, and the three requests are to turn him not from ice into a man again. These three requests are that, that Mylon be released. Um, and God look after all true lovers and Mylon, and that she remains unmarried. So that's a bit of a weird wish. Um, so, so basically, those are the three wishes that um, he's released. Um, God look after all true lovers, hence St. Dynwyn's Day, and that she remains unmarried, unmarried. I don't know why that's a wish. I don't know. So she becomes a hermit. And she dies in AD 46. You don't associate it women as being hermits. But there you go. There's a holy well on St. Doyne Wind's Island. And it's the well that lovers go to to drink from. And there's also fish in the well. And what you need to do is you need to look at how the fish move. And it uh, dictates how your relationship's going to go. Don't <coughs> ask, please. Following the Reformation, devotions at the sh shrine were suppressed. Those damnable men of Henry VIII said no. This is not to be a shrine associated with a patron saint of some kind. This is not supposed to be uh, the place where people go associated um, with lovers and St. Dynwyn. This is to be expunged. Um, and what happened was that the monastic landscape at St. Doinwins was rejected from the, um, from the land of Christianity. It was not to be a place of monasteries anymore. And it was closed down in the year 1536 by um, Henry VIII. However, the church did continue for a short while and then it fell into ruins. Um, and it's also, um, is, there's lots more other things to be said about this, but the walls are in a really good state of preservation and it's well worth a visit. And this is, this is the, one of the premier saints um, associated with Cymru. So there you go. This is what it looked like in, a, in about the 1700s, not so far after the dissolution of the monasteries. And going back, looking at a few more images, that's what it probably looked like in the 1800s. So it's still hanging on there. And this is what it um, looks like. This is what it. This is what it sort of looked like, but there was a monastery around it as well. Um, and there it is today. Lots of it is gone today. There's not a lot of, left of it really. That's one angle of this. But going from what it looked like in the 1800s, there's a lot. There's a lot left. Of, there's a lot less of it now. Um, and there's definitely a lot less. Uh, since the 1700s and you can actually get an idea that the lots of the um, window fenestration in the, is still there it did survive for a little while but uh, but then you know services stopped and um, and that's basically it so do you know what we've got to move to, from St. Dynwyn's now um, to another spot but you know what the reason why I have people joining me is to Ask what they thought. What did you feel about this site, uh, Pat? Just tell us a little. You know, I can't remember it. I'm sorry. Okay, Pete. Well, it was very isolated, as you say. And uh, out on that spit of land. Yes. Um, places like that have been put on spits of land in the past to... to um, keep them away from the mainland, probably um, so that uh, they were revered and they would be there, they would be used in times of seclusion, like in the periods of Lent and things like that. People would go there to remain in isolation. And you could lead a very pious life. And do you know what, Peter, you didn't know the le next place that we're going to look at, right? Everything you've just said, we're looking at Barsley Island. Well, there we are. Mm. So uh, you, you basically, um, so, so we've come from there and now we are now there. So we're, we're again in Gogleth, can we? We're still in, uh, we're still in the northern part of the country. And so what it, the, the main thing of these lectures is to actually show you other parts of Cymru as well. And, and you know, we've got to really do that. But so Bardsley Island, and strangely enough, at Bardsley Island, um, it's, it's a rather interesting history. Um, and it's a rather interesting history at Barsley Island. So this is where we're going to go. So let's go on to my notes. So we're sort of half, halfway through now. So I'm hoping 
they'll have enough time to do everything. But, it, you know, we, we should manage. Bardsley Island, a little bit of information about Bardsley Island. Bardsley Island, um, Ernest Entley, um, which basically means the island of the 20,000 saints, uh, which is a rather interesting title. Everything that Peter just said, it's an island of 440 acres, so it's not a massive island, but it was big enough to have an interesting population. And that interesting population was a population of monks. Now, there's, there's two prongs here. So the island has been an important religious site since the 500s. And it's associated with St. Cadvan. Now, that's rather interesting. And it's rather interesting from one point of view. The, the religious community there, before the Normans, were a religious community which name has disappeared in history. So in other words, it was a religious community of Cymru. It was not a Norman religious community. It was a religious community of Cymru. Now, because it was a great place of pilgrimage, thank you for that introduction, Peter. Um, it was a place that the Normans saw that they could make a great deal of money. So what they did, they removed those very pious, those very, um, th those very much in loved uh, monks from the island and they replaced them with Augustinian canons. So whatever religious order was there before it was removed. And Peter, I'm gonna use the term in the right context, uh, the Celtic church. Um, and I can, I can use the Celtic church. We're not talking about culture. We're using the name the Celtic Church because um, whatever the Celtic Church stood for before the Normans was almost erased, which is quite sad. And the same thing happened with Cornwall and the same thing happened with Cumbria. So that links the three C's. This is why we've got the three classes, Peter. Um, so mm -hmm. the mon monastic order on the island, the, the, the Norman Augustinian order was um, dissolved in 1537 by Henry VIII, um, but the island remains an attraction for pilgrims to this day, but unfortunately you're not going to get out there, um, you're not going to be able to walk out there as we did with the Island of Love, um, St. Doinwin's Island that we've just looked at. It's rather rugged, um, the home of lots of grey seals, and a little bit more information, we'll look at some, uh, we'll look at some images, um, it's an island that goes back to the Neolithic period. It's an island of farming. This is why they had an isolated monastery there. Uh, around 516, St. Aynion, uh, Aynion um, uh, who, who eventually, uh, who before was the king of Llyn, he becomes St. Aynion, <coughs> um, invited St. Canvan to move to the island. Um, and this was the place that later become known as St. Mary's Abbey. Just a few things before we look at images. It says the holy place of burial for all the bravest and best in the land. So this is the place to be buried, folks. The land of indulgences, absolution and pardon, the road to heaven and the gate to paradise. This is what this is the Norman view of Christianity, not the earlier view, not the Celtic church view of Christianity. Um, and I bear a great deal of cynicism towards Norman religious orders. I, I can't stand them because you could, you could go out to Bardsley Island after 1212 when the island was taken all over by the Augustinian order and you could basically say, look, I've murdered somebody, but I want to go to heaven. Will you give me absolution? If I give you a load of money, will you free me from this guilt? Will I be able to go to heaven? And the answer is yes. Now, this is what I don't like about Christianity. Um, you're free of your sins. Somebody else takes on your sins and you're able to go to heaven. This is what I really hate about looking at that side of Christianity. Um, people stop paying money into the island after of 1536, 1537. And you could say this was a honeypot for Henry VIII. 
because a lot of money would have been made in ripping the lead off the roof, taking the gold icons out, um, the, the silver um, vessels and, and all the, taking all the vestments and everything out and all the rest of it, taking everything away. Um, and this would have been a very rich location, a bit like the island of Iona um, and Lindisfarne. So, you know, all these places were, were very wealthy places and the dissolution of the monastery in some pla places and cases I actually very much agree with because they become fat on the wealth of the poor um, and the vulnerable. Uh, so, again, I, I, th I think we will, we'll be, we will be able to do all this. So, so the only remains of, of what was there is this building. This is all that remains. This is the only tower of the monastic complex based on the original thinkings of the Celtic church. And then obviously we've said things change. So, <coughs> Sorry about that. So moving on a little bit more and it looks like a military tower and in a way, in lots of ways, these monasteries after the period of, after the period of the Normans were places that the money was used to build high walls to keep the peasants out, uh, to, keep the, to keep those rich who were visiting safe and to keep the peasants out. Um, and it's not really the old sense of Christianity that people um, think of and aspire to. So obviously what we're talking about is that we've, we've got uh, the monastic landscape is all over hither. Um, and this is the modern day lighthouse is a bit barren, but you can imagine back in the day um, with a few trees, um, this would have been quite sheltered because of the hillock above. And surely, if you would have had a tower on the hillock above, this could very much look like Tintagel-like. The Tintagel of um, North Cymru. Let's have a look at a few more images. That would be really nice. Oh, and there's lots of holy wells. There's three holy wells on there. Like lots of monasteries, there were lots of holy wells. And do you know what I'm going to do in, when we look at churches part two, I need to take a note of this. We're going to look at, the um, Lady of Penrice, which remained for a very, very long time of the Celtic Church. So when we come to that, that'll be a very interesting lecture. And the Lady of Penrice is associated with the well or the spring of Penrice, and there's a well house there today. So that'll, that'll be another interesting one to actually look at, wells and springs and all the rest of it. So there it is. That, that's on the, um, that's looking towards the, the landward side. That's that, that's that deep, rocky outcrop. And interestingly enough, just a little bit of archaeology for all of us. Um, if we sort of zoom in on this a little bit more, if I'm able to zoom. Um, this is that LIDAR. Um, so what we've got, what we are seeing is that, um, trying to get this in perspective, you've got that bit of, um, you've got a big rock, rock sticking out and the monastery is per perfectly sheltered behind it. You can see all these monastic buildings uh, and you can actually see some of the old medieval uh, landscape with, within the, the LIDAR, th those are ridge and furrows up here. And lots of these buildings, um, all associated with the monastery and sort of some later quarries and so on. So fascinating that we can actually read this. The, it, the whole thing was demolished. It was completely um, ru made ruinous by Henry VIII's men. And it was almost as if nobody's gonna go back here. The, the religious days of this site are over. I gotta be honest with you, sounded a bit cynical. Um, maybe Henry VIII should have kept these sites going because it would have been a, a way and a means of, of making some money um, for um, the royal coffers. Because up until that point, the church <coughs> is making money out of people and why not use this for the king but there's a lot more factors than that it's a lot more complicated um, money was made off of selling the land to rich um, landowners i.e um, the landowners associated with Eubra. and again we mentioned Eubra a few weeks ago when we looked at um, um, king llewellyn of um, north wales um, and a little bit of an archaeological plan the abbey of saint mary of bardsey um, you can see that this is really all that survives today. This is all that really survives. Even the church itself, the, the sort of, you know, that's been sort of rebuilt out of, out of what was there. And it's a great shame, but that tower 
Is it worth a visit? Oh, I tell you what, it's worth a visit because of the view. Is it worth a visit to see the ruins? Yeah, it gives you a sense of perspective. Is it worth seeing the little church? Yeah, yes it is. So nice little visit, but I don't think we're gonna be able to get out there this side of the year. Now, did not one of you mention Nevin a few weeks ago? And I think when we, um, this, was, this was Gillian. Um, and I know Gillian will be joining us for the next, next eight. So we will be looking at Nevin on the first one next week. Um, the, 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 bleeding, the bleeding tree, and bleeding yew tree. And I, I thought Nevin Church, that would be great as one to actually look at. It's got an interesting church graveyard and it's also got several inscribed stones. And, um, and those inscribed stones, we won't be looking at the detail, but we'll have a little bit of a, a, a glance. It's, it's a very, very chunky church. You could say a hip church. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a strange little um, church. And what we've got to do, hang on a bit, the location, hang on. Oh, there it is. I don't know why that was there too late. In, there we go. There's Nevin. Uh, there's Fishguard. And if anyone's interested, there's Casteth Henlis. And so we've got all that into perspective. Pembrokeshire down here. I'll go over here. Um, Landewi um, Brevi or whatever. And, um, and Carmarthen and so on and so on. So that gives you an idea where we are. Uh, and I'm sure that um, the wonderful Ellen will be thanking me afterwards for actually showing her where these places are. So again, again, looking um, at the next image. And interesting enough, looking, looking into the church, you, you get... I think this is a, lots of weird little features with Nevin. Okay, you can spot spot the cross. So this is they're, they're making the stonework associated um, with the walls associated with the church. Um, what they've done, they've they've somehow worked in a cross out of the beds of stone that they're constructing, which I think is very unusual. I, I thought that was a really nice feature. Um, again, trying to date that would be very, very difficult, but it's, it's a really nice feature. And that is one of the inscribed stones. And if you look closely, and we will look at this inscribed stone again, there is the inscriptions, and that would be a wheel cross. A wonderful stone, a wonderful sandstone. Again, I've seen some of these stones. They're absolutely beautiful. I'm glad we've got several at Nevern, and I'm glad they've survived, but unfortunately, because they've been left outside, um, the detail is decaying a little bit. The answer at Langan in the Vale of Gamorgan was to put a little shelter over it, and it's, and it's protected, the one at Langan. So I'm not going to suggest that, but it's a shame that that's not a little bit more shelter to protect it. And I'm glad, but I'm glad it's not been removed um, from context. And there is the bleeding yew tree of Nevin, which Gillian wanted us to do in our tree lecture. Again, a wonderful facet of Nevin itself. And there you go. So what I would like to do, uh, we, we are going to go a little bit over because we did start a little bit late. Uh, and hopefully Eleanor will, will um, sort of catch up a little bit more. Good to, good to have you join us, Eleanor. Uh, so Nevin itself, what about Nevin? It's a small village today probably a much bigger village in the past. It's a village of a Neolithic landscape, a bit like Bardsey. It's, it's a landscape that was under the rulership of Daihebarth, Rhys Ap Tudor of Daihebarth. And unfortunately, it, this was part of the Daihebarth kingdom of those Welsh kings. And it was eventually, um, cook and by crook, it went back and forth between the Normans and the, and the um, kingdom of Daihebarth. And the original church itself was probably destroyed in about um, 1195 or somewhere like that, where the um, original um, castle of Nevin was destroyed and different thing, things like that. It's, um, and strangely enough, it's not mentioned in, in, a, in a great poem uh, uh, called The Black Book of Kamada, which it should be. It's a, it's a wonderful location. A little bit more information. Uh, the Nevern Cross on the south side of the church dates to the 900s. It consists of two sections fitted together with a mortise and tenon joint. Now, I'm thinking maybe um, I might disagree with some of that but that again but the other stone that we've actually seen 
may actually date from the 500s. Uh, and that is rather interesting for us, that it's a very, very early stone associated with a very rich kingdom um, like Dihaibath. We mentioned fleetingly Dreykainiog, and we didn't mention when we were in North Wales about the kingdom of Gwynedd, but the very old kingdoms of, of Cymru are the likes of Dreykainiog in Brecon and Dihaibath in, in West Wales. Little look at these uh, images, and, and then we're going to look um, for Dell's surprise at Hen Eglois, which he did mention a couple of days ago. Just have a little look at these images again, and that there is that other cross. Now, what it's saying is the mortis and tenon joint is up here, and those that are, are not really where, where what a mortis and tenon joint is, if we go something like this. If you do that uh, and move that there, that's going to be carved on the one stone. And then on the other stone, this is going to be carved like this. And that is otherwise known as a mortis and tenon joint. And they see this in the construction associated with Stonehenge. Now, that to me at the top doesn't look um, as old as they're indicating but again that for another lecture but it's a really nice old looking cross indeed it really is but the other one itself is hundreds of years older than this one so i'd like to get on to the last one hen egglois and if we um lessen that hopefully i've covered all the images we've done that one yes Little fleeting look at these again. Look at that really thick, fat tower. Lots of stone has gone into that. The patronage of the kings of Diabath went into this. And you know, that, that's why. Again, the bleeding yew tree. Again, that. And, oh, and one other little feature. Um, the, that's what inside the church tower used to look like uh, 30 to 40 years ago. And interesting enough, Llanvranach's church it looks very similar like that, like that inside. Not completely, but similar. It's as rotten as um, old wood, um, old railway slippers. And that there, that's a few views of the cross. It's, 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 very, it's very similar to lots of these types of wheel crosses with shafts in, in the Kingdom of Diabath, West Wales. And again, this is still in a church graveyard. And if it is the date that they say it is, it should be given some kind of protection. And finally, last but not least, and can I ask you, Peter and, and Pat, have you ever seen, been to Nevin Church? No. No. Oh, I'm bringing you all new things today. Oh, absolutely. So this is actually uh, the last one we're gonna do today. This is known as Hen Eglois Church. Now, we know where Port Talbot is, that smelly place. Um, hopefully nobody, nobody comes from Port Talbot. There's Pyle. Further on down is obviously Port Call, and then you've got Bridgend. And there you go. When you actually drive into the estate, over here you've got all the ruins of the old monastery uh, associated with Margam. And you can see it, and it's got the nice old... Um, it's got the nice old maze and, and the old the house orangery. there and so on. It's, it, it's a fairly interesting place. What did you just say, Pete? The orangery. The orangery. That's where I was looking for, the orangery. Thank you very much. And it's so good when you've got people joining you on this. And this is Hen Eglois. It, it's a church that you see from um, the park itself. And there's a little footpath up to it. And you can yeah. see it sometimes. Um, I remember I, it. I've seen I it think it's been there. closed when it's been foot of mouth. Pat, you were, you were speaking. And I walked up there through the bluebells one afternoon. It was gorgeous. One afternoon, yeah. I took my young explorers up there. It was great. You what? I took my young explorers up there. It was great, oh, yeah. Oh, great, yeah. And the view is fantastic. And did you, <laughs> see, did you see the Merlin oak tree? No. Ooh, oh, you have to go on a walk with me and Rosamond up there. It's so... So this, this, is, uh, this is one of the, and when you see it, that's sort of the view that everyone remembers. 
But then one of the gable ends, and then you look at it, and it's that fat squat church that you can actually see from down the valley. And, and look at that as well. It's, it's more ruinous, obviously. On the one eave side, is quite complete. On the other side, is quite ruinous indeed. And what I'd like to do is I would like to fit us inside that church. And Dell raised his hand. There he is. I, I know we get very excited with this, Dell. Um, and I'm just going to go on to my notes now, finally. And here we go. Hen egg voice. Remember the phone's ringing? Shut it off. So history, the church itself dates from the 1300s. It was built actually for the local population of Margam, not for the, um, not, it was served by the monks of Margam, but it was for the local people. It, it, in, in, I haven't used these words, a decorated and perpendicular style. A decorated style is when you get, when you've got, my, my art skills go out the window now, is when you get a window, um, and then you've got sort of a um, a set, a sort of more or less a pointed uh, in, um, sort of gothic -y type style, but you've got all this tracery coming in. Um, and actually, that that's actually not bad. Actually, um, that's that's <laughs> that's 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 basically a decorated style window. And then perpendicular is when you get something like this. Uh, and then you get the Tudor roses on the side, uh, and that's basically perpendicular. So that gives you style. So it's built in those two styles. It dates from about 1470. We got that nice clear date. Um, it didn't actually survive the dissolution of the monasteries either, even though it was even though it served the local people. And um, it's it's now roofless. There's a lot of certain sandstone used on it which comes from the Sutton Sandstone quarries at Ogmore by Sea. It's, it's rather interesting in, in its sense of isolation up there. And it's basically saying it, it's protected. It is protected. It's got some internal fittings as well. Something known as a paschina, which is, um, which is a rather interesting um, carved... Um, structure inside the church which I don't see we're going to actually um, see but obviously all the architecture there is rather rather interesting it's very very well worth a visit to look out at the landscape and look down at some of the remains associated with Margam Abbey today so what I'm going to do now I'm going to look a little bit more at these images um, that's inside and obviously this served the local community probably about 100 150 people Looking back again, this is the image that I remember. I've been there once and I've always remembered it. And that there is what they would call a decorated window because, uh, because um, the tracery, all the rest of it. And again, this, the one thing about this, it's, it's not been mucked around with because in the Victorian period, what the Victorians did was to rip out all the medieval stuff and replace it, which is extremely criminal really. So, um, what I'm going to ask, um, Pat, is there anything you would like to add uh, now, please? Yeah, I, I said I hadn't been there because I didn't know the name of it. But once you told me where it was, I was quite familiar. I used to drive past it every morning to work in Port Albert. And Adele said it's crumbling. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. And the one thing, one thing that you can see is these are the putt logs. These are the scaffolding putt logs. It would have been rendered on the outside. Um, and it would have been whitewashed, and this would have been seen for miles and miles around from the coast all the way out in the Bristol Channel. It was a really important, powerful site. Yeah. I've just got a bit of background noise a minute. Michelle, like we, everyone could hear the kettle. So, um, anything else you would like to say, um, Pat? No, oh, it's been very interesting. I didn't know we had so many churches nearby. In what these wonderful monuments. Uh, what about you, uh, Peter? Well, do you know what I'm going to say? That when you were looking at the islands, etc. Yeah. Of course, the 6th century St. Caddock would be out on an island. And obviously, there's a monastery somewhere out there. There's yeah. the priory, which they're excavating on Steepholm. Yeah. Uh, which uh, St. Gildas would have been uh, lived in for some time. Yeah. And so, you know, the, these these bishops and monks, they, they did like to be in seclusion in these places. An inter interesting point. At one point, 
the kingdom of Diabath loved Christianity so much that they had six bishops. Mm. Yep. We, we did religious religion very differently. Do you know what? Bring back the old... Peter, you'll never hear me say this again. Bring back the old Celtic church. <laughs> right, so what I'm going to do, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring... I'm going to cut the screen share, unusual thing. And... Now, I know we're going to be uh, losing some of you tonight, but um, I would like um, all of you to make a comment. Um, everybody's mics unmute you all. So, anything you would like to say, Gillian? I can't hear you. You've got to unmute yourself. Everyone unmute themselves. Right, what am I going to do? Del, you talk first. Yes, uh, Margam and the uh, Ridgeway between Margam and sort of um, across uh, St. Peter's Church. Yes. You know what I mean by that? We, we, did, we did St. Peter's Church in the um, forum today, actually. Yes. Um, I've, I've been up to the, that um, place that we've just seen uh, lots of times. I've had picnics up there and everything. There's also, um, I'm not sure if you've got my message today about the uh, monk's bath. No. Um, yeah, there's a well not too far away. Yeah. It could have been something to do with the Talbots who had Markham Park. Yes. And the you know, typical sort of, oh, we'll make a folly out yeah. of this. But there is some sort of well which could have been used in antiquity. Yeah. There are lots of um, Iron Age. Um, You've got the hill fort, fort nearby. Forts, um, you know, remains and things. Loads of them up on Marga Mountain. Thanks for that, Dale. Um, Go on. Right, I know you don't like King Arthur. Go on, you'll have to be quick with this because everyone's got to have a say. Go on, shoot it out. Yeah, I know you don't like King Arthur, but there is a valley up there. Manith Biden. Uh, Manith Aguide, which, um, Nantaguide, uh, River of the um, Blood. And uh, Manith Biden locally is sort of associated with King Arthur. Manith Biden. Uh, yeah. Mount Baden. There we are. Adele, I would say that um, you will be surprised that my, my thoughts about King Arthur are um, not as extreme as you once thought. Right, anything you would like to say, Catherine? No, I'm fine. I'm okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And, and um, what about you, Pam? Just try and keep it brief. I will do. I've been to Nevin. There's a lot more to say there. Yeah, there and is. I've not been to Malgam. Okay, that's a, definitely a place to visit. What about you, Gough, tonight? Uh, very interesting, Carl. Lots of lovely churches in Wales. Great place to live. Great place to live. And um, I would say if anyone else w still wants to sign up for the next lot, then you just need to do so. Um, <laughs> what about you, Gillian? Anything you'd like to say? Go on. The Nevin yes. Tree. Go on. Sorry? The Nevin Tree. Oh, the Nevin Tree is beautiful really beautiful now quickly how do you Go get to the church near cowbridge right everyone lots of you are local right They're, what you need to do you need to go in from lantwick major you need to head on the cowbridge road yeah um, and then you've got the cross in on your right park at the cross in on your right and you go across the crossroads um and up tight on the right there you can sort of see the the church through the bushes go along that road you can't, don't drive down it whatever you do i buggered my car up down it and just mm -hmm. walk there with hubby and you'll have you, you it's lovely go, right. even if you okay. don't get don't bother getting the key just have a look at the church it's fine ellen right. what what about uh, jill, jill give us a ring if you're going because i can come as well okay yes. well yeah. yeah i can i can say it is a nice walk it's a nice walk lovely yeah it is a lovely walk um what about you, Ellie? Would you like to say something? I think it was really interesting, and that was the most scenic of your slide decks that you have. Thank you. I appreciate so that was that. some very good pictures that you took. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. 
But Dad, I still prefer living in Bristol, sorry. <laughs> That's England. I know, I know, you need to get over here. Um, Eleanor, is there anything you want to say? No? Okay. Um, and and I, I think Helen's had her say, but if not, Rosamond, anything? You, you've got the last word tonight, I do believe. Oh, well, I, I, I thought the, the church at Slanvrenna looked very peaceful. Of all of the churches, that was the one that seemed really peaceful. And it would be a shame with the, the housing estate going around it to lose it, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'd like to go and visit it too. Um, yeah, the, 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 it was... housing, the housing estate doesn't really, um, I don't think will impact on it too much because it's like on the opposite side of the road. So uh, fortunately, but, you know, it's, it's um, I think it'll be okay. But my worry, Catherine, is that you're going to have children and people going over there. And that, that's my problem. That, that's sort of my, my thought. I'm yeah. just being a bit cynical. Um, yeah. Anyone want to say one final thing before we finish tonight, before I say my goodbyes? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? I got, that, it, it's my pleasure. Ellen, you've got the last question. Go for it. Um, you know, you said you were going to do like um, a telephone visit. To different yeah. places. Is it only you and one other or can several of us come? Um, what's going to... What, Michelle's insisted, right? Um, because she does wear the trousers. That why why the hell are we doing these recordings? Just me and Rosamond, when I can kill two birds with one stone, and get some of you guys out, right? Yeah. And that's that's what the plan is. All I've right. got to do what Michelle yeah. tells me to do. So in other words, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea, that, doesn't it? Yeah. But I don't want anyone butting in every five minutes, jumping into the camera and saying, hello, look at me, I'm live on TV. <laughs> so on that note, I'm going to say I really appreciated everybody joining us for this journey of the last eight weeks. Sorry to see some of you go in. We will continue for another eight. I will see some of you tomorrow, and I will obviously call some of you next week. Honestly, heartfelt i've really enjoyed your support over the past few weeks i really have and it's been a great great journey lots more to look at so i'm going to say thank you from my heart good night peter jill pam pat catherine eleanor ellen ellie dell goff uh, rosamond and and many thanks for you all joining us anyone wants to chat at the end is very welcome thank you very much bye okay, bye 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 no, no. Right. So um, are there any, anyone left at the end to have a quick talk about chickens? Tell me about chickens. your cannonball another day, Jill. Oh, I will. I will. Gillian is oh. hidden to secrecy. Not a oh, word, oh. Gillian. <laughs> no, Gillian, we'll have a good old chat. He, there's a nail as well in it. Not in the cannonball. I know, I've the, seen it. I, I, want, I want to see that concretion. I tell you what, right? Um, it can ki well, we obviously want the cannonball eventually to take around <laughs> Cymru, but honestly, see, on a serious note, um, obviously they got every right to keep it, that's fine. But if they don't want the concretion, we'll have it and we, we'll, we can break it apart and have a look at it. So, mm. it is something, something to see, really. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'll speak to you tomorrow. You do that. I'll see you then. Okay, yeah. lovely. Bye. 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 So, are you off now, Pete? Yes, I'm off. Nice to meet you, Eleanor. And, oh, you, um, don't, you don't want Sally, Sally coming along, do you, to the uh, filming?